The following is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. John Willen, CWRTDC president, interviews Janet Kroon, the editor of The War Outside Mayundo, the Civil War diary of Leroy Wiley Gresham. John references publisher Ted Savas, the managing director of Savas Beatty, as the inspiration for this program. Well, first of all, I just want to say personally how I got Jan. This is why I decided to have Jan. Is when we had Ted, Ted, if you recall, a few months ago, we had Ted Savas as a speaker. He was just raving about your book. <laughs> oh, oh, good to hear. <laughs> yeah, he really loved it. And yeah. when I started investigating what it was about, um, it's about this young man suffered from an illness that I've actually treated. It's uh, musculoskeletal and pulmonary tuberculosis. Some of the things she describes in the book I've actually seen, they're called cold abscesses. They didn't call them that back then, but they're collections of TB. And so I, I was just said, you know, I got to read this book and, and then have her as a speaker. And as my interest in civil war medicine, of course, piggybacks on top of that, because all the medicines and everything this young man is taking over the course of the span of the book is... Uh, great interest to me. Anyhow, you're going to hear more about that. Anyhow, Janet uh, Kuhn uh, recently retired from teaching advanced high school history in Fairfax County, Virginia. Originally <laughs> from the Chicago area, she, she lived in several places, including Dayton, Ohio, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Wiesbaden, Germany, before ending up in the northern Virginia suburbs. So Ms. Kroon holds degrees from the University of Illinois, where she has a BA uh, in political science, modern Euro European history, and Russian language and area studies from the University of Dayton. Uh, that's in international relations. Now she began teaching world history in the 20th century topics and in international baccalaureate programs for which she also did some contract work as a program moderator and student paper examiner. So her love of Civil War history came about almost by accident. She was apparently was working with a lawyer in the former home of a Confederate female spy. Mm -hmm. And then she read a book about the spy's friend a number of years later. She has two grown daughters uh, and she spends a lot of her time knitting cross-stitching and watching Cubs, well, not right now, but Cubs baseball. <laughs> we'll, we'll forgive her for that one. <laughs> uh, and enjoying the area once occupied by either blue and, or gray for the entirety of the Civil War. And she has a black uh, cat, kitten, who supervises her, her projects. And without any further ado, I want to present Jan Crude. Thank you very much. Yes, this is um, ended up being a, a, a good time for me um, with this, this project. Um, having left teaching for medical reasons, I found myself with not much to do. And then on Facebook, this news, news feed thing kept popping up. It was a, a story written by a Washington Post author about the <clears throat> Library of Congress presenting this collection of diaries for the sesquicentennial and it sounded so fascinating. And because I was a classroom teacher and I had used primary sources like this, I went to the Library of Congress and started reading and then contacted Ted to see if he had heard of this. He, not, he hadn't. Uh, he checked around and people he knew in publishing and academia had not heard of it. And he said, let's go. So um, I spent the next year doing transcriptions, footnotes, and uh, getting it put together. So it took about a year. Um, Ted said at the very first um, 
presentation that we did, which was in Leroy's home, <clears throat> which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, that he gave me deadlines and he didn't think I could meet and I met every one of them. And I think it was because I've been used to working with stacks of student papers for years and years and having to move quickly through them. Um, but as you can see by the handwriting on this screenshot of the diaries, Leroy had absolutely gorgeous handwriting. And it was the, the only difficulties I had were um, abbreviations I was not familiar with. Occasionally there would be words when I was transcribing, I would type them as he spelled them, perfect, expecting to get that red wavy line that says this is not a word and uh, didn't get it. So I learned some new words like freshette. Anybody know what a freshette is? A freshette is a, um, it's a flood caused by heavy rains. So it's a very particular kind of flooding. And um, you hear that in writing from this time period, it was a commonly used word that we no longer use. Uh, but this again is an example of his handwriting. And um, again, as a teacher, it's a little aside as far as my teaching practice goes, I will put together PowerPoints like this for students. And especially with ninth graders, I would use cursive fonts and tell the kids that they needed to learn how to read this if not learn how to write it. Because otherwise a work like Leroy's diary is inaccessible. Our founding documents would be inaccessible to them. They need to know how to work with handwritten materials. And um, they, they, they learned how to read it at least. So I feel like I've done a little bit to help with that. Uh, the image here that we have of Leroy is the only one that we have um, to date. We keep finding things. As a matter of fact, this week, we got a couple of new letters written during the war to Leroy from Leroy to his brother Thomas when he was in the field. Um, so we're going to be doing something with those um, before too long. Uh, I'm working on the audio version. We have a um, young reader version. I've worked with a friend of mine in New Hampshire. We put together a curriculum guide for our older students, and now we have one to go with the young reader version. So there's a lot going on here. But again, this is Leroy. We think he's about maybe 10 in this image um, and just a good looking kid. And as you read through this diary, you get a sense that this is a really bright young man. Again, the diary was featured in a Washington Post article. And um, I've gotten to know the curator of the Civil War collection. And she says that is a jewel in their collection. They, they all love this kid. They've read through a lot of his diaries. They're not at the Downtown Library of Congress, they're stored offsite. So I worked with the digital version, um, which they've made very, very accessible once you figure out how to get there. Um, Leroy was born in 1847 into a prominent slaveholding family in Macon. His father, John Jones Gresham, had been elected mayor twice in the 1840s. Macon in this period elected mayors every year. Um, anyhow, his, his father had been an attorney, an, an older man who actually, uh, they, the families um, ended up intermarrying, um, which is kind of an interesting story on its own. Um, <coughs> so his father had been an attorney. He didn't care okay. for the fact, and he became president of the Macon Manufacturing Company, which processed cotton. So they had a cotton mill in Macon, Georgia. And that's uh, good to remember when you get a little bit further into the war. Uh, Leroy kept a diary from 1860 to 1865. He was 12. He wrote in the diary nearly every day, especially after secession begins. Before then, it's a little spotty. And uh, his mother gave him like a pocket, a pocket diary. He and his father went to Philadelphia to see... Um, Dr. Joseph Pancoast, who was a very prominent physician <clears throat> in Philadelphia. He was one of the first sur surgeons to practice um, what we now call plastic surgery. So it, John took him, him, his son, just the two of them, and they went on this journey and his mother wanted everything written down because she wasn't able to go. And at this point, Leroy's writing like a typical 12 year old. 
the sentences are short and choppy. Um, you know, there are things like um, not everybody was sick on the boat. We saw whales. We saw flying fish. Um, he talks about things that don't seem to be very important on the surface um, after Philadelphia and his visits with um, Dr. Pankost. They went to New York briefly. One of his uncles had uh, a place in New York and he wrote about seeing Japanese people on the street. And I got, I got really excited and I, I made a footnote about this and Ted goes, why did you footnote that? And I said, well, Ted, that's the first delegation of Japanese to ever be on the East Coast. And Leroy sees them. I said, so it, it shows you, it, I just want to give readers in the footnotes a, a sense of what the time period was like, that this was a highly unusual thing to see Japanese in this time period. Um, so we would go back and forth on footnotes occasionally if they were like that. And um, I won that battle with him. Um, but Leroy was an invalid and he was sickly. He had to research that, um, I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. But he's also, as my friend Kim up in New Hampshire would say, he's wicked smart. And he's well-educated. This is a kid who reads Shakespeare because he wants to, not because he has to. Um, he's kind. He doesn't really have a bad thing to say about anybody in his common sphere, in his daily life. I don't get a sense of sibling rivalry here. I have a younger brother. We still have sibling rivalry. Um, and he's opinionated, especially when it comes later on as he's growing up uh, about the war and the progress of the war. Uh, these are his parents um, on the front porch of their home. I've sat in that exact space, not in that, that rocker, but in that space. Um, their house is now known as the 1842 Inn in Macon. It has been... Um, it's gone, it, uh, people lived in there. They said, oh yeah, I lived in the Gresham place that was broken up into apartments. Um, it's, it's now a very, very beautiful be bed and breakfast. You can go and stay there. Um, they tell me stories about people who have read Leroy's book and they just wanna see the house, but they're afraid to come in. So the people, the people who work there will invite them in and show them around the house and give them a personal tour. Um, it's just, it's a beautiful home. It's at 363 College Street in Macon, which is up on a hill. So you have to imagine Macon is the, the area where all the prominent homes were. We're up high getting fresh air from breezes. You go down toward the Okmulgee River and that's where you would have the business section. And there's a train line that runs along the river today. And then you have the river and on the other side, it goes up in a similar slope. So about two miles away from the Gresham home, there's um, Indian mounds that are still there, part of the National Park Service. Um, Macon was a very busy, um, a very busy town, a little bit larger actually than Atlanta. There are like five rail lines that converged in Macon and people would change um, their trains there. Um, so Gresham, and again, these are older images. Uh, you can tell by the clothing. Uh, they're both a little bit older here. Um, he owned about 100 slaves on two plantations, about 30 miles south and east of, Ma of Macon. And what I learned was not Houston County, it's Houston County. And the two plantations were known as Oakwood and Pineland. And that's actually two of the last bits of information that I researched and found were the names of the plantations. That was kind of hard to find. But I had help from the... Um, University of Georgia map library. I used census data. So I can tell you that, you know, how many slaves they had in the home, how many slaves they had on the two plantations, but I can't tell you which plantation is which. And I can't tell you the names of any except for sure, except the ones in the household because Leroy discusses them all of the time. The 1860 census is split into two. There's schedule A, which is white and free black individuals in Schedule B, which is enslaved persons. And the way they organized it, they would list the owner and then the overseer. And then they would talk about each individual slave that they owned um, from infancy on. Um, but they would only give you the information of their age 
gender and degree of color. So on some of the Virginia documents I've looked with, they talk about full black, mulatto, light. And that's the only descriptive information. They give no names. But of course, with a household, uh, you know, you're able to figure out who's who. This next picture, again, I've been saying how we keep getting things sent. A lot of times they'll, they'll go to Ted and he passes them on to me. Um, the next image I'm going to bring up is a really rare, it's actually very small, hand-colored daguerreotype image of Mary Gresham taken in the late 1840s. Now, one of the beauties of Facebook is you can belong to all different kinds of interest groups. And one of my interest groups that I belong to has to do with historic fashion. Um, and I asked the, the women in there, and there's a few guys in there, but I posted the picture and I said, what era is this? What's the time period? And this is the picture there. There's actually two more women to the left, but the woman that the younger woman on the, on the left hand side, we are 95% sure is Mary. The woman next to her, we like to believe it's her mother, Mary Ann Baxter. I'll talk about her in one minute. But just looking at the clothing in this image, they were able to, within 15 minutes, I had 20, 20 people responding that it's late 1840s. And I, I'm like, well, how do you know? How can you tell so fast? Well, you can tell by the, the cut of the bodice, the sleeves, the collar that she's wearing, the way her hair is pulled back. There's all kinds of little clues that you can get to date these images. And so that's, that's how we were able to. And, and if you look at the faces of the older woman above and the younger woman below her, and then there's a few other extant images we have that we don't know who owns them. So because of copyright, I can't use them in the presentations. Um, we we feel very strongly that that's a very young Mary Gresham, probably taken around the time Leroy was born. Um, her mother, Mary Ann Baxter, next to her, lived in Athens, Georgia. Her husband had also been a, a cotton mill um, um, manufacturer a cotton manufacturer. Um, so she was the only grandparent that the children, the Gresham children had, who was still alive during the, the Civil War. And she, they went to visit her for a month in August of 1861, and she came and visited on several occasions. Um, so you do get to know her quite well. Um, these are his brother and sister. They were Thomas was the first of the Gresham children born in 1844. And I looked all over the place trying to find this image because Leroy writes about when this picture was taken in January of 1864. You can do the math. Thomas was 20 years old and he was now going into the military. His father had sent him to Milledgeville to college. Milledgeville was the capital of Georgia at the time. He had gotten uh, Thomas um, a substitute, um, but the time came where those could not keep Thomas from going. And so he went and Leroy discusses the whole process of getting this image taken. These two young men were extremely close, even though there are three years apart in age. Now people who have had twins will often say that their kids grow up and they, they can communicate with each other in a language only they understand. These boys were three years apart in age, and they grew up also communicating in a way nobody else understood. His mother writes about this in the um, one of the, the letters that is in the book at the end. It's a real tearjerker where she writes about the loss of, of her, her middle child to, his, to her sister, her only sister. Um, Leroy learned mathematics, advanced mathematics from Thomas and another young man in the community named Jim Campbell. They would send mathematic project, um, word problems back and forth to one another across town. I've images of the servants running back and forth with pieces of paper with scary math on it um, because no one else was working at a mathematical level and Leroy wanted to do that. Uh, when Thomas went to Milledgeville and Jim entered the army, uh, he, he left the army as a major after being wounded. Um, he said, well, my career as a mathematician is now over because no one else can help me. Um, it's, it's interesting for me to read about Minnie Gresham, um, 
who was the younger daughter, also extremely close to her brother Leroy, um, the only, only girl. Uh, she was extremely well-educated as well, attended the first all-girls, accredited all-girls school in the United States, Wesleyan Female College, which was literally blocks from the house, um, as I have found out. Um, she ended up becoming a, um, an author in her own right. Uh, she married into a prominent Fairfax County family, the Machins. Uh, she and her husband, Arthur, um, relocated to Baltimore, which is where they met and where they are buried. Thomas is also buried in, um, in Baltimore. And I haven't gone to see them yet. I need to do that, um, but haven't. Um, Leroy talks about, and this is one thing that confused me, reading the book, I'm, I, I don't have a medical background, so I didn't know what the problem with Leroy was as I was reading through it because Leroy didn't know what illness he had, but he wrote about it, many being selected as a junior to read her, her junior thesis in public at the end of the school year. And we're talking about to the whole community. They filled up the auditorium for this. This was for young ladies. This was a very huge honor one of the few times in their lives that they could talk about a serious topic um, without being rebuked for having an opinion. Um, after they graduated, you know, you, you go back to being a lady and you no longer have an academic bent to your life. But um, she, he talked about her going with her to buy pencils and how expensive they've gotten, uh, how she was rewriting at Christmas time her, um, her draft and, and him reading the draft and, um, how she, when she presented, he can tell you, he, he writes about it. So, you know, the date, he tells you the time she, he's, she started speaking, the time she stopped speaking. He noted that all of the house servants were, were present. All the slaves were in the auditorium, listening to their young lady recite. And he's outside in his wagon, which was how he got around. He had a, a specialized wagon. We don't know what it looks like. We'd like to know. Um, but he's sitting outside and I'm like, what the heck? Why is he outside? Is the wagon that big that they can't fit it into a huge auditorium? It's still there in Macon. And so it was really confusing to work through this, not knowing it was a complete mystery. Um, they had two younger siblings who died very, very young. Edmund lived seven months and we know from an extant letter from again, from the, the people that own these, these two images, they had a letter from John to his brother, older brother Edmund, that his namesake had died from complications of pneumonia. And then Edward, who was born after Leroy, um, lived for 17 months. And I have not found any information on Edward as of yet. We have a whole treasure trove. We've gotten in a couple places across the US um, and we just haven't had time to delve into those yet. Um, but why the diary? And this, I explained part of this already. This is the, um, when you first open the, the small little diary he started with. Um, doing research, I did a lot of research with this. I love doing research. I found out from the memoir of a man named, um, he was a judge, Judge Ayers, uh, writing about, he wrote about a, an incident when he was a young boy growing up. And he talked about going to um, Mr. Bates's school, which was across the street from the Gresham home. And it's where the, the children attended school. Leroy was, um, he talked about Mr. Bates frequently. He could see the children playing before they went into school. And Judge Ayer said that they had heard that the Washington building had, had burned to the ground. Um, they rebuilt it in 1858. It's still in Macon's label, the, Washington building, 1858, it's brick now. But um, the boys decided after school, they were gonna troop on down there and they were going to poke around and see what they could find. And as they're doing that, Judge Ayers said that he saw that the only standing part that was left, the brick chimney was starting to wobble. And he hollered, everybody get out, it's gonna fall. And he said, the little boy next to him what took the brunt of the falling brick. And that was Leroy. He broke his left leg, probably in several places. 
Um, and Judge Ayers writes that the young man uh, was never able to uh, walk again and died shortly after the war. And that describes Leroy, the right age, the right place, the right time period. So we found out that he broke his leg in 1856. By 1857, he's developed a cough. His father writes about uh, to his mother who visited her mother in Athens a lot. So we have a lot of records, a lot of letters. Um, he said that Leroy developed this never ending cough. You could hear Leroy all through the night, he writes in 1857. And by 1860, he has developed these nasty abscesses on his back. And that's why he travels with his father to see Dr. Joseph Pankos who I've already talked about. Um, he liked Dr. Panko significantly. He thought that this was a man who had all the answers to his questions that he could, he could cure him. He writes at one point that he, he was so excited that um, General Carney had been killed and he was so excited because he, they, he mentioned Dr. Panko, who was Carney's personal physician. And then in parentheses, he goes, I was excited to see Panko's name, not Carney. So he's got this wicked sense of humor um, and just says things that are just, you laugh out loud as you're, as you're reading it. So the diary, as I said previously, was a gift from his mother. You can see it's got 1860 and all kinds of scribbles on there. Um, on the right-hand side, she had written a prayer and uh, she signs it as well as Minnie and Thomas before they left. Um, Again, educate. I can't get over this kid's education. Again, I taught upper level kids. And by the time he is about maybe 14 years old, he is writing at an intellectual level that's beyond his years. The, the way teachers look at, at um, expository writing, he's processing things and coming up with his own evaluations, um, some influenced by his father, but he's able to express his thoughts in a really advanced way. Um, he loved math. He was very, very good at chess. Um, and he loved science, especially astronomy. One of, in one of the journals, he has a table of um, the astronomical events, you know, the um, eclipses, partial eclipses, um, stars, you know, uh, meteor showers that are expected during the year. And he writes about those in detail. Um, He's inquisitive, talkative, sweet, funny, and kind. This um, clip I took here, the screenshot, you have all the little scribbling there, this little toddler scribbling. And it could be only two people. One, it could be um, um, the, one of the little girls who was actually born in the Gresham home the same day that Leroy broke his leg. So you imagine there's a, a baby born to one of the servants in the house his son breaks a leg. And that morning, he had written a letter to his wife saying he wanted her to come home for her um, confinement. So at, this, at that point, when Leroy breaks his leg, his mother was expecting that baby never was born. So she must have lost the baby at some point. Um, but he writes, it could have been uh, Florence, or it could have been his little cousin, Tracy Baxter. But Tracy Baxter's mother was um, one, of, one of the Johnston sisters who were very wealthy. They owned uh, original owners of what today is known as Hay House in Macon, um, which you can go in and see, and it's just, it's phenomenal. Uh, they're in the process of renovating it, and uh, I have to go back and see what they've done in the past couple of years. Um, so they were they were very wealthy, and his uncle was John Springs Baxter, who became a um, Confederate surgeon. Um, Tracy's mother, Carrie, dies before the baby is a year old. And while the father's away at war, he's being raised at Hay House with his aunts. And he spends, he comes up to um, the Gresham home quite frequently. So you get to see Tracy grow up as well. So I kind of think it was Tracy because at this point he would have been about a year, a year or so, maybe, maybe a year and a half. Um, but Leroy writes above it, some jackass got hold of this book and tried his hand at writing. So in, he, he 
has these ways of saying things and notes them in the margins. It's just the way a kid would be. He loved pets. He had a whole series of dogs named after Confederate generals. He seemed to have a good relationship with everyone, especially the man that I kind of look at as the, um, the caretaker of the home. Um, a slave that he would follow around. And it seemed that he um, you know, taught Leroy how to plant his favorite fruit. He, and Leroy would watch him do all sorts of things around the house. Um, he's opinionated. He had an opinion about pretty much everything, including the photo of his brother, which after all that waiting and all the detail about getting the picture taken, he didn't like. He said it was a complete failure probably because that was a serious looking young man um, about to go off to war. And the war had been going for a number of years. They'd lost several friends and relatives. Um, so for Thomas, this was a serious thing. And I think Leroy was just missing the face of the, the, the kid who used to shoot robins in the backyard or put pebbles down grandmother's um, grain pipes in the, at the home. And just the kind of tomfoolery that he would go through. And the entries include some Mark Wayne like witty phrases. He's just, it's amusing. You will be amused reading this. Um, the social life, one of the things that's important about this, and it's it's unique in this way, is that you get the view of Southern family life in the mid 19th century in an urban setting. Um, there's, I talked before earlier before we started about Mary Chestnut. Um, she's kind of like, a, she's up in rare air. She's best friends with the first lady. So you get a good sense of what some people thought at the higher levels. This gives you day-to-day -day views on what it was like and how daily life changes because he writes almost every single day. I think he misses no more than maybe four or five days throughout the whole war. Now, not all the entries are extensive or detailed, but many of them are, and you get a really good sense. He describes the food, the clothing, the conversations, the interactions, the stream of visitors that would come into the home. I won't spoil some of it. Um, some of the the um, some of the the people that come into the home are quite exceptional. Um, there was one again. I kind of had a tussle with Ted about the town uh, about the um, footnote. And he said, well, who is this Reverend Axon? And I said, Reverend Axon married Woodrow Wilson and his granddaughter, Ellen Axon. And the other person was um, Thomas Wilson, a Presbyterian minister. Um, it's a highly Presbyterian family. Um, John Gresham was one of the elders. They would have these annual meetings and the year it was in Macon, all these people like Reverend Axon, Reverend Wilson would come to the home. And he goes, what, what about Wilson? I said, that's Woodrow Wilson's father. He goes, well, what's the deal? I said, These, this family is gonna be connected in the future, not just now, but in the future. And to give you an example, one of Winnie, Minnie's best friends, one of the last things John Gresham did in his life was get this young woman a position working for the Bureau of Labor and Statistics in Washington, DC. Uh, you could only do that for a woman if you had connections. So you follow them from the peak of their influence. Leroy kind of forgets to tell his diary about the new carriage father bought. It's like, you know, for a boy today forgetting to write about a new car. Um, to the, the defeat in the war where John Gresham is trying to get a nutritious meal for his son and is using family silver to trade for steak. Um, you've, they go from being incredibly secure in their future and to being very, very insecure. Um, I've included a, at the beginning a dramatis personae, a uh, list of, of the major individuals so you can make sense of all the people. There are, in the family tree I've developed on ancestry for this family, there's 1,701 individuals there's three cousins from Alabama I can't place. So, so somebody must have, they kept track of it because they acknowledge these three boys as cousins. But um, there's, for example, the, the name Mary, there's gotta be 50 Marys in that list. So I had to hone them down, figure out who's related to whom. Uh, it was fascinating research. 
but I was able to do it. So you know which cousin Eliza is against Aunt Eliza because he knows who he's talking about, but we didn't. So we got that all figured out as well. Um, he follows the politics of the era. Um, he really gets involved after secession. And at the beginning, he sounds a lot like his father. He writes, my father says, and it's a lot like ninth graders I would teach. During political election years, for example, um, you could tell where the kids' parents, what they thought because they were mimicking their parents' political thoughts. By the time I would get some of those same kids back in 12th grade, they've got their own ideas. They can explain why they think the way they do. And Leroy does this. He says, I disagree with my father on this. And he explains why. Um, he loved Jefferson Davis, although the support wanes by the end of the war because he realizes that decisions that are not based on what's best militarily, but who Davis liked individually. And there, there, there are problems with running a military that way. Um, he despises Governor Joe Brown from the, from the beginning. Why, I'm not exactly sure. Joe Brown was a very um, strong personality. He had already had two terms as governor of Georgia. Um, at that point, they were electing governors every other year. Um, I would tell that to Georgia uh, audiences after their last gubernatorial election and they would groan like, oh God, every two years. Um, and he was you know, upset when Joe Brown was elected a third time. And he, was, he just said, this is a, a, a despotism when Governor Brown was elected the fourth time. Um, Brown and Davis did not like one another. Jefferson Davis would announce a day of Thanksgiving and prayer and Joe Brown would make it another day in Georgia. He said, no, we're gonna do it the following week on Wednesday, not this Thursday. Um, he also um, had a fondness for Alex Stevens because Alex Stevens was a family friend. He would bring grandmother mail from Richmond on occasion. So he was known to this family. Um, again, he's happy about secession at the beginning. Um, he mocks Lincoln and Northern soldiers, which is common. Uh, if you haven't already, um, take a look at the political cartoons of Dr. Seuss in World War II, and you will be shocked. It's not one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. It is, it's very, very different, pulling on every kind of uh, ethnic stereotype that he could for our um, the countries we were fighting in World War II. Um, Leroy does this as well. He talks about the first skirmish in Fairfax County, for example, in June of 1861. He talks about you know the, the Federals came over into Fairfax Courthouse and they were just pressing to see what kind of defenses the Confederates had. Uh, and then they retreated. The first Confederate officer, um, John Quincy Marr, was, was killed in Fairfax Courthouse at this point. Um, but Lincoln said, um, oh, uh, not Lincoln, Leroy said, now we know how Lincoln is building an army. He's emptying the saloons and giving the drunkards guns so they can shoot up the women and children of Fairfax Courthouse. So you get little bits and pieces of that as well in there, um, just kind of the that the Southern side of it, how, how things were perceived. Um, the war itself is interesting. If you know nothing about the Civil War, you don't have to because Leroy didn't either when he started writing this diary. You learn along with him. And um, one of the first people who read this book was a friend of mine. We'd known each other since before we were both in elementary school. And she said she was fascinated because she forgotten everything that she was taught in Illinois about the Civil War. And it was fascinating to her what, uh, reading his, um, his, his views as things went on. Uh, one of the reasons for the extensive footnotes is to put the battles, the personalities, the culture into context. For example, the Battle of Richmond. There was no Battle of Richmond. It was the seven days. Or, uh, I'm sorry, this is wilderness. 
that they're talking about. Um, you know, up the road from here, around the around the bend in the Potomac is Leesburg, and he calls the Battle of Ball's Bluff um, the Battle of Leesburg. So we had to make um, clarifications there. So the footnotes help you follow it. Um, he gets news from his father, of course, from newspapers, magazines, other adults. The month that they spent in Athens was hard because Athens, Georgia did not have telegraph. And the editor of the um, Macon newspaper was frequently at the house. He had telegraph, so Leroy could get news really, I mean, from, right from the telegraph itself. Um, the letters that were sent home from his uncles, he had seven uncles go off to war, a number of cousins. Um, those were really important for finding out what happened. He was very interested in how Georgia troops were doing, um, mostly because a lot of them trained in Macon. As I said before, it, Macon was a railroad crossroads town. So it was a convenient place for people to come from all different parts of Georgia, form into, into groups that they weren't already in groups and do their training there where they had um, all kinds of um, manufacturers to make all kinds of supplies. Um, they took the fairgrounds that were south of town and turned them into a training, training ground. And they would go out to watch the soldiers learn to march and Leroy would critique their marching abilities. Uh, it was later made into an officer's prisoner of war camp. The enlisted troops were sent to Andersonville, which was not too far away. Um, so you see a lot of change there. By the end of the war, Macon had a, an arsenal, an armory, and a ballistics laboratory. They produced all kinds of war material, um, which is, you don't hear a lot about that, but they were extremely important. Um, there's perceptible mood swings as the South wins and loses battles. And um, Vicksburg is a really good example of that. Um, the mood goes, you know, it looks for a while like things are going good and then things are not going so good. And the mood swings just, you can, you can follow those. Um, and, and by the end of the war, he realizes that they are losing. It's just, how are they going to lose? What will happen to them is what the question is going to be. Um, he covers Sherman in the Georgia campaign pretty well. Um, Leroy saw some of the war from his roof Someone had to have carried him up there. Um, Ted Savas, they didn't let me go up there because I had an orthopedic boot on. But it was a really narrow staircase from his father's bedroom up to a, a little part on the, the, on the roof. And if you um, kind of eliminate the tall trees that are there now, he could see the whole thing happening. Two miles away, like I said, by the Indian grounds is where the Union set up their artillery and fired into town they only damaged one house, which is known today as the Cannonball House. You can go and visit it. You can visit Hay House. You can go inside Leroy's home. There's a lot of really good antebellum homes in, in Macon. Macon's a really interesting place. Um, but he could see some of this from the roof. There are two instances where the, the war comes that close. Um, the first one was when, um, they were trying to get through Macon to relieve Andersonville and liberate the prisoners of war. And that didn't go well is the cavalry that went through there ended up getting captured. Um, one of his cousins ends up in Sherman's, in Sherman's way. And uh, when she relocates to uh, Macon, she tells her story about what it was like um, at seven months pregnant. Um, processing the news. This was one of the unexpected things that we got out of it. We learned a lot about how the news was followed. And as my, my friend who had was not into the Civil War and, and relearned it as she read, she asked me, she goes, why is it that when they have all these battles, there's all these Union dead that they talk about, but not very many Confederate? And I said, well, that's because um, fake news. Um, they would often do that at the beginning, possibly because they didn't have complete information, but also to not depress the home front. 
Um, but Leroy learns that after a while, you have to stop and question what is going on. And he would start to say that he was going to wait for Lee's, um, Lee's order about the battle before he made his final decision. Um, the news clipping I have here was from the Macon, Macon newspaper, and it's actually a clipping from the New York Herald. So at times they would use each other's newspaper reports. This was probably to fill up space. I'm not sure which battle this would be, because um, they talk about, about Grant, he talks about Grant throughout. Um, but he learns to, to be very suspicious and, and just take it in, in stride. Now, Leroy knew about, he follows everything from the Army of Northern Virginia to the Army of Tennessee. He had two uncles that were in the um, Trans-Mississippi region, two killed in Texas. Um, he knew about the Navy. He knew names of bootleggers. And it was kind of like, he who shall not be named. He wouldn't put the name of these bootleggers down in writing in case it got discovered or something. But he knew what was, he knew a lot of what was going on. And his diary lets us see how civilians processed the slow and often incorrect news. And one of his uncles was only seven years older than Leroy. He was captured, he was wounded first. He had part of his hand shot off at, at, um, at Sharpsburg at Antietam. And he was captured later on. And they were very worried. They didn't know if he was alive or if he was dead. And then he ended up at Rock Island, Illinois. And then they would be able to send him things and he would write back whether he got them or not. Um, send this message to his girlfriend, the woman he eventually married. So you get to see those kinds of things um, through letters. This one clip I pulled out, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's dated July 7th, 1863. Mr. Clisby was the editor of the Macon newspaper and he had come to the home People knew that Lee had crossed the Potomac another time. Leroy wanted to know if there was any fighting in Maryland. And Mr. Clisby says, no, not in Maryland. There's been a skirmish in a little town in Pennsylvania. Leroy writes, Mr. Clisby thinks it was not a large affair. And then he spends the next week or so writing about nothing but Gettysburg. Um, and it, it's interesting because even with Telegraph, Mr. Clisby didn't have good information. And this is four days after the fighting at Gettysburg had stopped. So you have to kind of look at that too. And, and especially in a day where we have instant news, um, students would be really interested to see how long it actually took to get information back done. Um, this is um, um, stock photographs of slavery. Julia Ann was the, the slave who gave birth to Florence, uh, who was growing up in the home. And you look at the detail, and this is just a regular everyday occurrence. And he puts all this effort into writing her name. So, you know, there's fondness there. Uh, as I said, the, the 1860 census showed that there were 93 slaves on the Gresham plantations. There were eight in the Macon household. Um, he mentions many of them by name, even the ones who come up from the plantations. He knew them, he was fond of them. Um, some of them would, would do things like one had made a chess table for him. Another one uh, did some repairs and put that little chess table, put wheels on it so it was easier for Leroy to move his chess game around. Um, and they were skilled workers. They were uh, wheelwrights, they were um, blacksmiths. They had other kinds of uh, carpenters. They would come in and do uh, skilled work in the home. Um, the, the women who worked in the household, for example, Julia Ann was a seamstress. Mary was a cook. Um, they all had their different skills. Um, he describes how the plantation supported the family home. Um, for example, he talks about one one wagon load, it would take a day for the wagon to get from the plantations, which were side by side. They actually could, probably could have been one huge plantation, but they were two separate places, but right next to each other. Um, it would take a full day to get from house to, to Macon. And he describes his father coming home once sitting on top of bales of cotton. They were bringing the cotton up to the mill. Um, they He would talk about how much Pork was slaughtered each fall. 
because that's what people lived on. And to give you an example, it's a story that Leroy doesn't really, he touches on it. He knows the story, but so he's not gonna tell us in the diary. But I was able to find out that um, to help the poor and help the Army of Tennessee, which was going through a lot of, of starvation. We hear about that and how the troops didn't have enough food. John Gresham comes up with a scheme that he will give um, the poor a, um, a yard of, of cloth from the Macon Manufacturing Company for a pound of bacon. So he had all this bacon coming in. Some of the extremely poor, he gave bacon bags. And you don't have to pay the bacon, keep it, you need it. And then he sold the excess to the Army of the Tennessee. And there's a couple times where the man who was responsible for dealing with John Gresham on this, on this, I call it a scheme. It's probably not a good word for it. It was, it was legal and actually quite, quite, I thought it was quite ingenious to figure out how he could support the poor, keep his factory going and support the army at the same time. They come to the house and I was able to find, figure out what it was they were doing there. Cause he said, talking about the bacon. Um, um, so slavery, he doesn't talk about as an institution. It's important to remember that Leroy and his parents and his grandparents, they grew up in this, in this system. He talks about little slave babies of the neighbors who die. Um, he talks about illnesses. Um, he talks about one time when, um, I believe it was Julia Ann, it may have been one of the other housemaids who was rushed in the middle of the night down to Houston. Leroy didn't know why it all went so fast and he, he didn't know what the problem was, why she had to be taken down there. And it turns out that her sister was dying and his parents wanted um, Julia Ann to be able to visit her sister, see her sister one more time before she died. Um, they also seem to be able to write to one another. Leroy talks about grandmother's uh, maid servants writing letters to his mother's maid servant. Um, he talked about um, one of the, several of the slaves run away, but they're caught and brought back. He talks about one who got away and he says, well, everybody thinks he's probably gone off with Sherman's army. I'm sure that's probably right because it was during that time period. However, this, this slave who got away writes to his mother back on the plantation stating that he was working for a surgeon in the army of Northern Virginia. Totally unexpected. So I've been researching that kind of um, of dynamic as well. It's, it's very, very interesting. Um, so again, they're very close to these people. They, they were there um, throughout their lives. I did find out at the end in, in Mary Gresham's letter to her sister that none of the slaves were expected to care for Leroy's um, wounds. That was always done by family members, except for Minnie, uh, the younger daughter. Um, but there's a, a lot of affection between these people. Um, and again, as, as we've talked about before, he was terminally ill. Um, again, I'm not a doctor. So what got all said and done, Ted and I are discussing this and he goes, well, what killed him? I said, I have no idea. Because for me, tuberculosis, it's the standard thing you see on television or you write about and read about in books is someone coughs into a clean handkerchief and comes up with blood. That was tuberculosis for me. I had no idea also, a 70 cent of people at the time carry tuberculosis in their system. But as we're now learning in the days of COVID, some people are strong enough where they've got it, but they don't know it because they're suppressing it. It's people who are vulnerable like Leroy with his leg that never quite healed. Um, that is probably what contributed to the TB that was already in his system to emerging and taking over. He had a, a, he was never told. He writes a few months before he dies, it's kind of heartbreaking. He writes about what he wants to be when he grows up. And he's got a problem, he says, I can't go to college like Thomas. And I really don't know what I want to do, but I want to be productive. I want to do something. And um, I often think if he had not died, if he had not had that leg injury, we would have heard of Leroy in one way, shape or form. He was that unique of a kid. 
Um, his version of the disease ate through its back. And it's called POTS disease. Uh, one of my physicians um, from, who's from Pakistan uh, talked to me about it because he had seen it. He said, you can tell people who have it. We know somebody in the audience here who has seen it and treated it. Um, it's something that we don't normally think of. TB is um, pretty, it's Dr. Rosbach who helped us with the diagnosis. So another one of Ted's authors, he said, it's like, you know, a zebra in a herd of horses. We see the horses, may not see the zebra, but it's there. He writes about his symptoms, his remedies, his pain, his treatment in great detail. Um, I, I pulled all of that information out, sent the document off to Dr. Rosbach, and he came back in two weeks and told us what he thought the diagnosis was. He is a surgeon up in Michigan. Um, and from what we know, this is the only detailed TB account by a patient in the 19th century, written the way that it is. Um, he had no idea what it was. He's not looking for a benchmark. Um, he's not looking for a certain thing to happen to tell him that death is imminent. Um, he's still looking for a cure. He still wants um, his doctor in Philadelphia to pull through for him. Um, this is a drawing of the spine. Um, it's not like hunchback. It's in the next picture, often further down. Uh, so when he starts talking about his, you know, the left leg had been crushed and now his right leg is not working right. Uh, you can kind of see why with the, the obstruction in the spine, it could be nerve damage, things like that. Also muscle atrophy because he's not using his legs. He says, but you know, if this continues and my right leg doesn't, stops working, I'm gonna not have a leg to stand on at all. So even through all of this, he's still got this sense of humor. Um, 1865, he's taking more morphine. He tells you how many grains of morphine he's taking. He's taking morphine, laudanum, straight up opium. He's taking alcohol, um, an interesting compound called Dover's powder, which is half of the dried component, syrup of Ipecac, which makes you throw up, and um, opium, which is I just, it's a, a really interesting compound. And they take that like Tylenol um, for just about anything. As I said, he grew increasingly concerned because a good leg began drawing up, became useless. Again, he was mostly taken around town in his, in his wagon. His brother would pull him, his, his, um, his friends would pull him. Journaling took his mind off of his disease. That became really important for him. And I noticed as we got towards the end, that the handwriting began to change. Now, this is not something that you're going to notice in the print, but I do put parenthetically in here um, when, when it was the last entry, it was like towards the end of May, um, 22nd, 23rd of May of 1865, where it's no longer his handwriting. And we need to figure out whose handwriting it was. There are a few times where he tells us Thomas is writing this, sometimes, um, sometimes not. I figured out it was his mother's handwriting. This is the front page of the letter. Her handwriting, it tends to um, lift off the page and can sometimes be illegible. And on the last entry, June 8th of 1865, it's legible. It's just one um, four word sentence. I am perhaps, and then we couldn't read it because the pen lifted off of the paper. So the ink wasn't getting embedded in the paper. And Ted was able to take his publishing technology and look at the um, indentation made by the quill. And we found out that it was, I am perhaps dying. Um, and after that, there is, there's nothing written for 10 days until June 18th, 1865. When his father writes, he always used a very bold blue ink and um, had a very strong hand, writes that the author of this diary, uh, Leroy Riley Gresham, died June 18, 1865. Uh, I mentioned how heartbreaking this letter was, seven pages to her sister. And it gives us the details of those final hours, uh, the fact that he had a day without any pain apparently. 
where he was comfortable and he felt okay uh, as, as well as he could because he's dying. But, um, and it gave detail about the burial included in, in the book as well. And she was very disappointed that none of the, um, the slaves came. Um, that kind of surprised me a little bit, but um, she talks about how he got angry with her. And it's not because he was dying and they didn't tell him. Um, he was a, um, like the whole family was, um, a very faithful pro um, Presbyterian. Uh, the day when he was welcomed into the church, they had to come up to the house to do it was one of his his best days. The only thing he ever reads on Sundays is religious, um, things that are religious. And, and um, so he had strong faith. He wasn't afraid to die, but he was upset because his mother hadn't told him so he could give away his personal possessions in person. He didn't want to do it, have somebody say, Leroy wanted you to have this. He wanted to be able to bestow his gifts upon people personally. His diaries were given to his sister because it is her family that donated them to the Library of Congress. And that's how we have them today. So he's chronicling the decline of the Old South, which paralleled his own decline in death. I went to a Civil War roundtable in Ohio, and one of the gentlemen afterwards said that this is uh, uh, Shakespeare could not have come up with a more perfect tragedy, the way this this ends up playing out. And again, its value is that it's it's real. Uh, this is a real person. Uh, you can see Ted's hand there on the uh, on his headstone um, at Rose Hill Cemetery. It's a historic cemetery. Um, it's a a really unique cemetery. Um, you have two kinds two, three kinds of people that go there. You have family members, um, you have people going looking for historic individuals, and then you have people who are fans of the Allman Brothers because they are buried there too. Um, like I said, Macon is a really interesting place. So his gift to history. This, this diary is the only teenage male non-combatant account of the Civil War. I tried looking. Ted said, you've got homework. Teachers got homework find something else written by a boy in this time period. And I could not, could not do it. Everything else was written by um, men who were in battle or men who were older or boys who maybe had survived being in the war, but nothing like Leroy's. So it's a very unique perspective. And we need those unique perspectives to give it a full picture of what the Civil War was about. Um, it's the only insider's view of a prominent Southern family during the Civil War. Uh, it's the only detailed diary in the world on the course and treatment of TB in the 19th century. Dr. Rosbach put together this book. He fills in that last word, I am perhaps dying, and gives you more detail on the, um, the treatment, the medications, why they used what they did, um, why they, he thinks um, they did certain things with Leroy. Uh, he had his wounds lanced twice, that's in detail. He gives you the detail of it. Um, it's by Dr. Dennis Rosbach. He also wrote about um, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and his wounding at, um, oh, blanking on it. Petersburg. Petersburg, yes. <laughs> I'm looking at the map in my head, Petersburg. Um, so he's, he's got a book about that as well. Um, Ted asked me, what is it like? I said, well, the only comparison I can come up with is the speaking as a history teacher who's worked with kids in the classroom. Is It's very similar in many respects, not all, but many respects to the diary of Anne Frank. And he goes, whoa. And we stopped chatting online, he picks up the phone and says, explain this to me. And I said, well, they're both teenagers. They're both extremely perceptive. Um, they are very gifted in the way that they are able to write about their experiences, what they're seeing, what they're feeling, especially with Leroy's medical issues. Um, Anne Frank wrote as a, a girl, adolescent growing up, 
she wrote about other things that Leroy isn't going to write about. Um, but, but she's also describing their situation, hiding literally away from the Nazis in an attic in Amsterdam. Leroy's got a, he has a, a an attacker who he doesn't even know what it is. So, and he's hidden away from society as well. Once I knew that it was tuberculosis, the story I told you about his sister reciting this big important day in her life, reciting and he's in his wagon outside, now makes sense. His parents knew he had tuberculosis. He didn't. So he has to stay away. So he's, that's why he's outside. Then it all became clear why he doesn't physically go to school. He's pretty well self-educated. Um, answers a whole lot of questions about Leroy and why things were the way they were in his life. Um, and Frank, we recognize as the young voice of World War II. Um, I see Leroy as the young voice of the Southern Confederacy. Um, just giving a different point of view, a different perspective on this war that is still very topical today. Um, so that is my presentation. Um, you wanna take down, take a screenshot or write this down. You can get a copy of the book, 25% off um, and using the, virtu the code virtual. And you'll get my signature. <laughs> the book plate. So that is what I have for you tonight. If, I'm welcome to take any questions. Yeah, Jan, thank you a lot. That was terrific. And before we open it up to questions, I just make a couple comments because of my connection. Um, num number one. I um, hoped you would do that, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Dr. Pancoast, I'm well aware of, and his son was also a very prominent surgeon. Uh, he would have known of, obviously made that diagnosis. He was a pretty smart guy and Potts described Potts disease in like the 1760s. So it was well known by that particular time. Here's a question that, that I have. Maybe you can answer it for me if you don't mind me asking. Um, sure. My sense was that um, Leroy's father took him to Pancoast because of his plastic surgery <coughs> abilities, maybe hoping to close the wounds. And Pankos told him, I can't do that. Yeah, because well, that, that, and that's what, they didn't close abscesses in, in those days. That, that much they did know that you had to drain an abscess. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm sure that he figured it out that he probably had Potts disease. He, he had been professor, at the time that Leroy's, some, he was actually professor of anatomy at Jefferson. Prior to that, he was professor of surgery at Jefferson. Mm -hmm. So he was, he, was, he was a pretty skilled guy. Um, as far, oh, by the way, there was a Michelle Kroll who you work with at the library. Yes. yes. Yeah, yes. she's a member of our group here, you know. So. That doesn't surprise me. She's delightful. <laughs> She, she made, maybe in the pandemic, I've been bugging her to actually get me to allow me to see the actual diaries. Maybe when this pandemic is over, I can start bugging her again. <laughs> and um, yeah, and the, the perhaps I'm dying is that's a separate volume. Huh? I, I think I better get a hold of that. I, I know yeah, a it's a, it's a small that. book. It has excerpts from the book, but it also has um, Dr. Rosbach's discussion of it. Of, yeah, I've lectured on Chamberlain's wounds too, but that's interesting. Yeah. Um, you're just we want to let people ask questions, but there, your fake. First of all, folks, if you haven't read it, one of the greatest parts of this book is the footnotes. You learn as much from the footnotes as from anything else. It's terrific. Thank you. And and um, talking about fake news, at one point he said that Seward had resigned. And I saw your clip there. It said Stan Schneider would be interested to know that General Webb had been killed. That's what it said in that clip, which obviously didn't happen. Um, so, and uh, there are some other there there's some other fake news that he he talks about in the in in his diary. 
which you, as you point out. So let's, let's let other people ask questions though. Okay, the best way to do that is by pressing down your Oh, and by the way, Leroy the named it, he, not only did he like Dr., he named his cat after Dr. Pankos. Yes, um, okay. in one section he writes about the cat and names it Joe Pankos. <laughs> So Jim, uh, Jim Carr, you had a point to make if uh, you can hold down your space bar and then you can mention it. Uh, yes, well, I, I just mentioned that uh, uh, that the brother is buried in uh, Greenmount Cemetery in Baltimore, which yes. of course is where the remains of uh, John Wilkes Booth are located. Interesting, interesting. Uh, I I definitely need to get there because the sister is there as well. And what's interesting about Booth, I'm researching this, is my my grandmother's my mother's mother's grandfather was a surgeon with the 30th North Carolina, and my grandmother always asserted that because they were Garrett's that there is a tie to Garrett <laughs> Garrett's farm, and so I. Just out of curiosity, I'm going to try and see if I can figure out if that's true or not. So, uh, Edgar, yeah. you have a, uh, a question. I see you're raising your hand. Uh, yeah, I sure do. Uh, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. And thank you. you mentioned uh, that he, his greatest interests were in science and math. and uh, But you also, you also showed examples of his drawings and you said that he read Shakespeare because he wanted to. Does he discuss Shakespeare? Does he have other favorite authors like Edgar Allan Poe? And are there any drawings that we have of his? Uh, we, I put some drawings in the book. There's one of, of a guy in a stovepipe hat who's somebody else is aiming a little pistol at him and he doesn't label it, but it looks like um, somebody <laughs> taking a shot at Lincoln. And that was another thing I, I did with with um, as we were working through it, Ted is like, why are you putting all these pictures in here? And I said, well, because I could walk past any of my, my students and they're doing the same thing. They're practicing their names. He practiced his name all the time, um, making little drawings, doing math problems in the, in the margins um, and things like that. So we included as many as Ted would tolerate because um, he didn't want to make it all pictures. But, it, you know, there's commonalities between all kids. And I, I was able to see that because I've spent my life working with these kids. Um, he did write about other, other authors. He was um, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Was, he couldn't wait for the last edition to come out. It was serialized. So he was waiting for that last one to come out. Like, I wait, I'm waiting for the next Outlander to come on TV. Um, <laughs> He also, and this is really interesting, um, I'm in a couple of book clubs online, and one, it, they were reading Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, which he mentioned several times, and it's a fascinating book. It really is. It's one of the first whodunits, mystery writing novels. Um, so he, he writes about that, about how much he likes that author's work. So I was, I've been able to actually read some of it. I've read a couple other period pieces that are kind of melodramatic. There's one he mentions that I've read that uh, his aunt and his mother cried over. And he's like, I don't know. It, would, it, wouldn't, have, <laughs> it wouldn't have appealed much to an adolescent boy. But um, he doesn't write too much about um, the American author so much. Uh, he reads new newspapers, magazines. Um, people come to the home and they bring books for him to borrow. I mean, that kid's a voracious reader, a real voracious reader. Um, so, Did yeah. you read Walter Scott, Walter, Sir Walter yes. Scott? Too. Yes, they do. <clears throat> he talks about having read uh, Scott's second for the, his brother read Scott's second book for the third time. I'm not sure which one that is, but he talks about what his brother and his sister are reading as well. So you get a, a really good sense. He read Punch, which is British political satire and yeah. loved it. Wow, wow. That, that's incredible. Uh, how, how rich are we are because of his diary, but you wonder what he would have achieved in his life if he had you know, been able to grow up, go to college. You know, you wonder what 
what great accomplishments he would have done in his later life if he had lived. Exactly. We, Ted and I talk about that a lot. You know, what could this kid have done if he had not had his leg smashed the way it was um, and just been able to have a, a, a normal kind of life? Um, we both think that he would have done something that we would have known about him. Paula, Thank you. You, you, you all, thank you, uh, Edgar, for asking. That's a good question. Paula, uh, you also had a question. If you could uh, press this yeah. piece for. Can you hear me? Am I? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, I have my book, so I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, <laughs> um, but you mentioned briefly, and I just didn't catch it, how um, this ended up all being saved in at the Library of Congress. Yes. Yes, it was, it's a part of the Arthur W. Machen collection. And that's a larger, much larger group of papers. Um, and this is just one little segment of it. Um, they were a prompt family, a legal family in Fairfax County in the time period in the Civil War. You see um, the, that name frequently in, um, in legal things that I've looked at. Um, his, her husband's father or grandfather worked for the, um, he was an archivist for the U.S. Senate and saved all of that documentation during the War of 1812. So they were, they were quite, quite prominent. Um, there's a, out in Western Fairfax, right off of Route 28, there's a little place called Eleanor C. Lawrence Park in the, this little house is called Walney. That was owned by that family as well. I used to take my girls hiking there because they had park programs. We would take go hiking there in the summertime when they were little. I had absolutely no idea that there would be ties that maybe many had spent time at this little house, which I, I kind of think is really neat. But it's, so, so uh, it was kept within it was kept within the family. Yes. And then in the midst of a whole bunch of other papers, there was this find yeah. Right, exactly. And there's a, a, like I said, there's a bunch of family letters in there. Um, we found the, the people who had the um, daguerreotypes have letters um, of his brothers. Um, there's a publication that talks about one of, um, it's, it's about the desegregation of Boston of all things, but it talks in detail about one of Leroy's cousins and what happened after the war during reconstruction. So we get a glimpse of what some of the options within the Gresham family would have been taken. There's some letters to Job Gresham from John Gresham that we can, we can pull. We're thinking of doing something with these letters because it gives you such a full, a much fuller picture of the family. Uh, for example, that the day that Leroy had the leg accident, you have Florence born in the household, which was, I, I'm sure was, was quite an event, you know, when you have a baby born and uh, the mother was away. Mary was visiting her mother in Athens and she was pregnant at the time, but that baby just did not survive. So you, you get little bits and pieces. We don't know very much about his mother. She's still quite an enigma. We'd love to be able to find a diary or, or more letters of hers. Um, so there's, there's lots more, lots more work I need to do to find out questions that people have, because I think this is such a, it's kind of a, a, they're kind of typical, but there's, there's information about them that's out there that we can get to. So again, the fuller, I've always been a, a proponent of the, as much information as you can get, the fuller picture is as close as we're going to get to historic truth. You can't just read one side or the other. You need to have both sides. You've got to be able to understand both sides to really understand the issue of the problem or why we went to war. And uh, Kim Holy and uh, former president of our round table uh, has reported that there's always information being found in coming out. So uh, keep up the faith that you'll get some additional information. David, um, I see you have your hand up. Do you have a question for Jan? Um, I was wondering if you if you're aware of other um, similar diaries by adolescents during the course of the war. And uh, yeah, that's. Yeah, there are some by adolescent girls. Um, 
there's a handful. There's one. I'm gonna I'm gonna blank on the names. Um, but there's one who was out in Front Royal. She wrote. Um, there's a couple of others written by uh, women or young girls who refugeed out of areas and and kind of moved across the south, but none by boys. No, there's not. mostly diaries of girls. I haven't been able to find any by boys. Um, and another ironic twist is one of the ones that, that I read was written by um, Ann, Ann Froebel, who lived in the Washington, um, Mount Vernon area of Fairfax County. She talks about her brothers um, having been gone and her um, one of her brothers actually was one of Thomas's commanders in Macon. So it's just odd, these connections keep intersecting with one another. And it's actually the map that this man drew of um, Houston County is that we use to pinpoint where the um, plantations are located. Um, it's an undeveloped part of land. People call it Oaky Woods today. Oakwood, Pinelands, Oaky, Oaky Woods. Um, and so Ted at one point would like to, he's talked about it, I don't know if it's gonna happen, put together an archeological um, survey to see what's there. Can we find any of the plantation remains, foundations, things like that? Yes, I'd like to ask a question. So uh, obviously, uh, the young man was a terrific writer. And uh, Janet, I'm particularly curious about uh, your other existence as an IB teacher. Yes. Uh, <laughs> when uh, I was a student, they did not have IB programs. And I, I'm just curious, uh, the students entering the IB programs today, I'm, I'm curious about uh, how well they write or don't write. Um, writing is a really important part of IB. Um, the seniors, uh, they sit for examinations, three, two or three different, what they call papers. They're all essay. So they're writing, um, depending on how they're, they've got two hours to write two essay questions. And they, they are, the marking of it, and I've done some of the marking, is very specific. So they've got to meet all these high flying criteria and they've got to be able to look at things um, analytically. So we're teaching analytical thought as well as historic information. It's not like my daughters were in, um, I live in Loudoun County. They went to Loudoun County Public Schools and they got a good education. AP is mostly about memorization. A lot of it's multiple choice. Here they tell you blue or black ink or it doesn't count is, is how strict they are on it. But I feel that the kids in the IB program end up with a, um, they're able to think, express themselves, they come up with an opinion, they can explain it. I always um, taught them when they're writing for me, look at it as like a, um, you're putting a case in front of a judge and you've got your witnesses and you've got your theory and then you've got to explain how they merge together and make your final case. So um, the ones, and they, they've gone off to some pretty, pretty good schools. I had one, he was 16 years old, he went to Harvard full ride. So that's a culmination of a lot of different teachers in a lot of different disciplines. But I love teaching IB because I could push them. Thank you. Thank you. Once, once again, I wanna thank uh, Jan for a great presentation. And thank I also you. wanna thank everyone for attending uh, the meeting. Mm -hmm.